It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Thursday, April 4th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high-quality content that's getting real introspective with John Tortorella right about now. Yeah, it's, he's going deep. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here, as always, with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. We are at Locked On Flyers on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Blue Sky as well. You can find our show for free over on YouTube or on the SiriusXM app or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Wow. I'm still like ruminating on what John Tortorella had to say at practice yesterday, which was an optional practice, by the way. But uh, 18 18 guys were there. Sean Couture was not. He is still day to day uh, as of recording. But Jordarello talked for, I want to say like 15 minutes, which is real long for him. Well, there were probably fewer reporters there because it was optional. And that's when he tends to drop what we call his best stuff. So doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And so he kind of covered um, really just a, I think, in addition to some specific questions, right? But really just looking at the big picture of the team and where everybody is and you know, what's coming up, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later in the show from our perspective. But, um, you know, he talked about how sometimes you got to go through things to help you to take that next step forward. But um, he talked a a lot about, I would say, two major themes, like the honesty and transparency side of things. And then he talked about, um, you know, this position that they're in now, how to get over the hump and what his accountability is in that role right yeah and i think he's being 75 percent honest i think he has some honesty issues of his own like has he thought about the fact that he didn't do load management has he thought about he's been too hard on sean katuri because he can't really do anything else has he thought about any of that has he said anything about that no not really yeah it, it is Interesting, because I don't think he said anything directly about that. That is for sure. That's for sure. Uh, I would I would definitely remember that. Uh, but, you know, when he was kind of, you know, talking about himself and his own job performance, um, he said that he hadn't done a good enough job to get this team over the hump and be executing at that higher level necessary to succeed in a playoff race. And, you know, he said it's on him and the players to do that. And I think this that is your you... captain, right? So if you're telling me he's had no one-on-ones, which he said, you can't have a one-on-one with your struggling captain. Really? There's no time in the day for that. I don't come he on, didn't... Rachel. He okay. I'm going to say he did not specifically say that you're, you're jumping to a conclusion in a lot of ways. What he well, did no, I... say is that he does not have a, a lot of one-on-one meetings. Most of what he says he feels like he can share in a locker room or in a group setting because that's the way he operates. He wasn't talking about Sean Couture specifically. Now, can you read into it a little bit on that front that maybe he should? We can say from the outside, well, maybe you should have that conversation. But I think it's a philosophy that he's running with, and he has continued to be consistent on that philosophy. It is a philosophy. We can say if it works or not, but right. I don't. I don't think he needed to say that specifically about Kachuri. Well, it is a philosophy. I do think he needed to say that about Kachuri because he is his captain. And there's a thought out there, especially in Canada, for people who don't see the Flyers every day, that why is this coach treating, you know, this captain like this, a guy who's a lifetime Flyer who's got a great reputation. So that is out there. It's not like it's just me thinking about it. And we know if Couturier had a great one-on-one meeting, he would tell the media about it because he's talked about when he's talked to to Torts before. So those kinds of things, and and I think it was, what, last game where Jordan Hall reported that he was getting admonished on the bench. 
you know, in that game where the, a lot of players could have been, you know, getting an earful of that game. But that that day, Sean took it. So I, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, and I don't disagree that those things happened. I'm just saying that that wasn't really the focus of what he was talking about in in his remarks per se. I think that, um, you know, you could, again, you could read into it and you can apply what he said to the Sean Couture situation, but he did not speak specifically about John Okay, well, let me ask about, you this. About Sean Couture, and I want right. to make that clear. Okay, but let, let me ask you this. So a captain is supposed to be the intermediary between the coach and the players. Do you really feel like there's a lot of that going on here? I feel like it's broken. Well, I don't I, see. I don't necessarily think it's broken because I don't think there's anything there in John Tortorella's eyes to break because he has stated and repeated as such that that's not his philosophy to have one on one meetings and to operate like that. He wants to talk in front of groups or in front of the team as a whole. And that's what he reiterated. So in his eyes, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do oh, I'm I know. In, in his eyes. It's not broken because that's not the way he runs it. Okay. And again, take it or leave it. Think it's helpful or not helpful. I, I, you know, I think there's some things that are not helpful about this situation as it relates to Sean Couturier. I don't think you're wrong there. I just think that he doesn't see it, at it as necessary because that's not how he runs things. But I, I think that the other aspect of it is the accountability of talking about, you know, we've talked about it consistently, um, that this is a different kind of hockey than early regular season hockey. It's a playoff push. It's almost yeah. playoff level. And you got to run things differently. You got to play differently. You got to come together as a team differently. And he says that he hasn't done a good enough job to get over that hump. And I think that's fair. I think that's a fair self-assessment from him because that's the coach's primary job. Now, how is he not executed on that? By overplaying some guys, by doing all the things we're talking about in terms of mm -hmm. things that coaches are ultimately responsible for, right? Right. But then, okay, so then my fallback on that is you still have guys like Mark Stahl, you still have Eric Johnson, guys with tremendous playoff experience. Does it ever occur to the coach to say, hey, you know, talk to these young guys. Eric, you know, get some wool under your wing. You know, help them out a little bit. I don't know if any of that goes on. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. He talked a little bit about some of those things and, you know, seeing the mentoring happening. But I, I can't speak to it specifically based yeah. on what he just said. But um, what what I can talk about what he just said is directly related to that is like this was a banger of a quote i gotta say where he said um it comes down to oh they're gonna quit on him it follows me around and so be it if a player's gonna quit on me or players are gonna quit on me because i'm trying to make them better people or better athletes you got the wrong damn coach here and you're gonna get the wrong damn people here like that that is a doozy and says quite a bit well i mean so that is part of what the discussion was to start the year. Like if you're a rebuilding team, do you want John as your coach? Right. And so he's basically throwing that up there now um, that a doesn't care, which we, we knew, uh, but B yeah, it might not be the right thing. Like he's throwing that out there now into the universe. And so we have to, we have to take that to the next, next step on that because I, I don't think he would say it if he didn't hear it or see it written or talked about. So that's one thing. So he, and he, you know, he's not a dumb guy, obviously he's a smart guy. So he, he could read the landscape and he knows. Right. right? And we talked about it on yesterday's show. There were two mailbag questions related to that topic right. on yesterday's show. Go back and listen. You can hear what we had to say about um, him potentially not being around next year. And would Craig Berube be a good fit for this Flyers team? Right. But, I, it's not a new topic of conversation to your point. It's not. It's just, I feel like we're inching closer to that happening than it not happening. Now, yeah. was that going to be the case two months ago? I don't think so. I think because this has been a, a very hard stretch run for the team and for him, 
that he is sort of like thinking about that. Like, all right, maybe, maybe there is a better coach for this team than me. If they're not going to respond, he's always going to think he's the right coach for it. And I don't blame him. He's had a lot of success in the league, but, there's only so much you could do with player personnel and changes, and especially when you have a team philosophy. And I think now this is where that that those two ideas are finally meeting. Uh, is it very late and too late in the season to have it? Yeah, absolutely. It just this, this should have happened uh, before the trade deadline, but it apparent you know, but it probably didn't. So now it's it's sort of rearing its head, and this is we you know we got it this early on. And it's not bad to have the success. It's not. But you can't take this year's success and try and take it a step further by losing a lot of assets and and losing um, young players and trading young players, some of them that may be able to help you in the future. And that's where I think the philosophy now is is different between the team and what the coach would like. Yeah, well, it is a make it or break it time. And Torts has a plan for it. And we're going to talk through it. Uh, in addition to what Tort said he wants to do about it. And we'll do that coming up next. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Are you watching sports on cable TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all the shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Tomorrow, we are going to talk about Flyers versus Sabres and Blue Jackets, our weekend games. And those are the first two games of the six remaining games that the Flyers have this season. And going back to what John Tortorella was talking about in his availability, he said specifically he's going to be holding a meeting today with the team where they focus on mindset and he wants to make up for whatever deficiencies he thinks he had in this motivational side of things to get them to play at the next level and talk about the whole underdog mindset that he, he thinks that, you know, the mindset that they had earlier in the season is nobody thinks we're going to play well, we're going to prove them wrong. And they did like that prove it has already happened. So now we're here What do we do now that's separate from that underdog mindset? And I thought that was interesting because the underdog mindset is very motivational for athletes. Well, it is. Yeah, that should be enough alone. But I think I think there's more to it. Okay, so if we break it down, uh, bringing in Fedotov was a risky Hail Mary kind of proposition. You know it and I know it. So they did that. They still didn't get a win. They got a point, but they didn't get a win. They were looking for a win. They were hoping to completely change that game, and it didn't. Uh, So then I could tell you that just the feeling uh, around that building was the air was out of the balloon a little bit. Like they knew that was a super important game because they also knew with all these teams having games in hand besides the Islanders, now the Islanders were back in it when they were pretty much out of it. So I think – that was all like known. So then it's like, okay, what am I going to do now? Because even though we had the lead here, we're not playing as a team, like we had the lead and they're not. And so I think this is his idea and I don't think it's a bad one. I think you have to try something. Yeah. I think, you know, it it may be too little too late, as you said, Uh, you know, they could have done it two weeks ago or, 
right after the right after the trade deadline to be right. like, okay, Sean Walker's gone. This is our team now. Right. Reset your our, mind. Yeah. And you know, maybe they did something to that effect that wasn't publicly stated, but right. it's very clear that they needed something like this to talk about it. And um, I think that it's it is a good idea for them to do this because six games is not a lot to put your mark on something. And so no. you have to put every ounce of everything into all six of these games. And it's not just because of, you know, what you are doing and what the flyers are doing themselves in a vacuum, right? Because that's, that's the most important thing for real. Like, it, you know, you can only control what you can control. Right. That's true. Right. And so you got to focus on the flyers and, and what they're doing and their own, strategies and motivations and mindset right so i think i think, I think what happened is though the mathematicians in the organization got to john and said look uh yeah. you don't control your own destiny anymore you don't play enough right. games and so they still are the underdog even though they have the lead in that way but i get what he's going for here yeah yeah absolutely and now at this point you know if you finish out this season strong, regardless of how the standings turn out, I think that puts the team in a good spot. I, yeah, I don't think it's going to be looked at like this team's a complete failure because, no, no, I don't think you could look at it that way. No. So we start out with the Sabres and Blue Jackets. We have four games on the road, by the way, and then two games at home to finish this season. So, you know, we're at the Sabres, the Blue Jackets, the Canadians and the Rangers, then come home for the Devils and Caps. The Flyers are 17, 13, and 7 on the road this season. Um, they have generally played pretty well on the road. But things have changed for these other teams. That's the worry here. Yeah. Blue Jackets, yeah. I can't tell you what they're going to do. Nobody who nope. writes about them can tell you what they're going to do. So that one, I'm going to push on the side right now because I don't have any read on the Blue Jackets. I do have a read on the Canadians, and they're beating a lot of good teams now. Yep. Like this they are. stretch, and them at home – they're worthy right now. And so that's. Well, and we saw that very recently against the Flyers in particular. And they're doing it so, to other teams now. Yeah. And I know, think that, need wins. that is going to be a hugely important game. I mean, they all are right. But in terms right. of the mindset thing and getting over that hump, I think that game in particular is going to be one of those games. The, yeah. Sabres, the Sabres, by the way, are coming back a little bit, a little bit because, you know, the Sabres just beat the Caps. Yeah. And so the Sabres helped out the Flyers here a little bit, but, uh, and so that put the Flyers back in the three spot as of today, uh, you know, before the um, uh, Wednesday night games. So right. I think that you look at having four games on the road, four games against Metro teams. The Flyers have struggled against the Metro this season, eight, nine, and five. Their last win against a Metro team was December 19th against the Devils. So that's a huge, huge factor here. Yeah, I, honestly, they have to win all four yep. in regulation. Because after that, bad things can happen. There's a three-point game coming up, a potential three-point game coming up with the Capitals in Detroit. That could be a killer. If everything stays close, like everybody's at this point, when that game comes up, that game's a killer if it goes to overtime, right? And so you just have to win. You have to take care of your business 100%, which they should have been doing down the stretch anyhow. Like that's the only way to look good to get into the playoffs rather than you're getting in because you're the, you know, the the best of the worst. Yeah, exactly. Now I will say, like, if you want to get ticky tack about it, the Blue Jackets game and the Rangers game, it's okay if those are three-point games as long as the Flyers are on the two-point side of that. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's the Capitals uh, one. It's really the Devils and the Caps game that you want to get those two points in regulation, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, although by that point we're playing the Devils, we may know differently. But right. I, I think that, uh, yeah, the, these are you got to win in regulation games. That's just... As, as a general rule and you have to yes. be able to be smart about if you're whole, if you have a lead, how to hold that lead. If you're right. coming from behind, you got to do it effectively and you got to do it smartly. So you don't put yourself out of it. I mean, I think early goalie pulls are going to be a, a much bigger risk than they have been. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No question. I mean, I don't even know who's the starter next game. I have no idea. I can't tell you who. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I think they're obviously going to split it because it's a back to back, but you yeah, know, but which I way, think, like who's gets the next, I don't, one? Know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I literally know. could not tell you. Um, I would say Urson versus the Sabres and Fedotov versus the Blue Jackets, but your guess is as good as mine on that front. Uh, yeah, you know, we're looking at, again, you know, prior to the Wednesday night games, Detroit's one point back with one game in hand. The Isles are now two points back with one game in hand. It is it is just going to be a fight to the finish. It is. It is. And that's the whole thing here is it's, a, it's really about overcoming some of these injuries, but it should also be about playing who's healthy. And, yep. you know, Torts will play a 50% banged up veteran over a hundred percent healthy prospect. If it's, if he, if he feels like that prospect hasn't played his system the right way. So he'll play, you know, a half hurt anybody over Lixell as an example, or, you know, and, and that, that's what bugs me. Like that's, you know, those things bug me because and you have to be open-minded to the fact that that guy could actually help you win a game. You have to be right, and I think that. that is going to be the first indication to maybe he's trying to, you know, have that accountability, right? Yeah. If we see him play Elixir over somebody who's hurt, that is a huge indicator that he gets the importance of what's right. going on here. I think. Right. Or even if he does it for some and not the others. Or, I think, but if, but know, if he goes 11 7, then that's an indicator the other way. Right, because he knows the forwards are, are broken right now. Right. A lot of the forwards are broken. Now, the defensemen, you know, are broken in a different way, but the guys coming back are a little bit fresher legs, like Sealer right. and, and Drysdale are a little right. bit fresher legs, even though they may not be 100%. At least they're not exhausted. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, Sealer's not the same, but he, right. you know, but he was okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we will be talking about those first two games uh, in more detail on tomorrow's show, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, we are continuing our draft eligible prospect profile series, talking about Leo Saline Willenius uh, coming up next. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you could still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boasting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 to, uh, 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. So Leo Saline Willenius, Russ, uh, I'm excited to talk about this guy because mm -hmm. um, he is uh, at a real interesting juncture. Uh, he's still at the U18 level in Sweden, uh, but he turns 18 on April 10th. And so um, he is like on sort of this borderline age thing as it relates to U18 worlds, uh, but is... Uh, a, a left-handed defenseman playing at that level. He's played U18 and U20 level in the in the kind of junior system in Sweden. Yeah. And uh, so, why did why did you pick him of all the guys that our friend Mike, who suggested a, a bunch of players, why did you pick him? No, because I saw him at the Five Nations, and I saw him playing like first and second pairing, and I was like, you know, this guy is kind of like um, Sandine Pelica light. I think, I think there's a lot of um, similarities there, but I think there's a point where it stops. Um, but there's good things. There's good things here. So as an example, thanks to Instat, I could see he's averaging 23, over 23 minutes a game. That's a lot, but that's, you know, sometimes 
that's what guys do in junior hockey too when you're the best player on the team or one of the best. So um, com- with the two teams combined, he's actually one point over a point a game, which for, you know, a defenseman, that's great. Like that's really good. And he's terrific on the power play. Like he's really smooth. He's He's got a great shot. He's a terrific distributor. So all those things play into this. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're the Flyers and you are looking at that second first round pick, he could be the guy that you say, okay, yeah, logic, logically we would like to pick him with our second round pick. And I don't know where their second round pick lies, but let's just say it's in the middle of the round, right? Well, he might not last that. He's going to, if he's a second rounder, he's going to go within those first probably five to seven picks, you know? So that's why they might have to just say, hey, okay, you know what? We have a lot of righties here that could play the power play. We don't have a lot of lefties. And and so, you know, he could be that guy. He's 5'11 and a half, so maybe he can grow a little, but I don't think that's a big deal. At 175, yeah, he needs to, you know, put on a little bit of muscle, and that's fine. But his de- his development pattern's good. Uh, at least he is playing some, some uh, J20. He's a little bit behind what Sandy Pellico was in his draft year, and that's okay. Uh, but really good prospect, can skate really well. Uh, really, there's, there's a lot to like. And he takes good um, – his defense is, is like – what I, you think you can get it to average. So mostly you talk about his offense, but his defense isn't bad. It's just – it's not like above board as far as – or not above board, but like a plus right now in his game. Mm-hmm. So, like, what is that difference that he's like a second round guy versus a first round guy? Okay. So, you know, the first thing is unfortunately the 5'11 and a half, that thing. Um, the second is the overall game. And although he wins 51% of his puck battles, which is interesting. And that's why I think if he gains a little more muscle, uh, that'll, that'll prove out. And then the third part is, He's not like a superstar at any one thing. His mm-hmm. best thing is being on the power play. But his second best thing is the amount of ice time that he could play without making huge mistakes. So that's why. But as an example, you know, like just today or well, yesterday, um, you know, Scott Morrow just got signed, you know, by Carolina. He was a second rounder. He's a really good defenseman. So, right. you know, no shame in it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that, yeah, based on everything that I saw about him, it was that complete game issue um, in terms of, you know, the defensive side of things. Yeah. Um, I did. I was really intrigued by his power play work because I think that, you know, the Flyers have had guys that they thought like defensemen that they thought would step up and take that role and haven't necessarily excelled at that at the NHL level. And right. with this guy being a little bit kind of lower on the totem pole, uh, so to speak, like why can this guy be the one to take that next step and be a really solid power play quarterback? Well, okay. So we have to say right now, like with Emil Andre, the jury's out, like he's doing okay on the power play, but I don't think he's the, a whiz. Right. He's he's closer to being a whiz, and he's been like the number one power play guy on all, on all of his teams. Like he's averaging well over, I think I saw it was at two thirty seven or something for power play time. When you're averaging that much, you're getting a lot of it. The lion's right. share of the power play. Sometimes guys average three minutes, but it's rare. So so when you're looking at that, that's why because he's already going up the ladder. He is the power play guy. He is the guy they're looking for. He is the, you know, the man where he's distributing the puck. That is the reason. Yeah, I think like that's key to me, right? Because if that's his bread and butter, you want to have a high ceiling on that skill in a prospect that you're picking in the second round, especially, I would say. Yeah, no question. I mean, because again, a lot of the guys you see on the Flyers power play won't be around in three years. Yeah. So you have to start reimagining putting new chess pieces on that board in three to four years. And um, he is playing in the U18 tournament coming up, right? I believe so. I haven't seen the full rosters, but I would think he can make that because I I don't think he's going to age out of it. 
Yeah, that's I was just wondering with his birthday before the tournament, like how all that worked. I wasn't 100 percent sure on that. But um, if so, like, is he a top pairing guy on on Sweden's U18 squad or is he like a second pairing, but a power play? He's he's done both. So I think he, you know, it's really going to be up to the coach, but he's capable of doing both. I've seen him do both. Excellent. Love to hear it. Uh, this is another great prospect. So once again, thank you to Mike who sent yeah, us a good list job, of some really, really good names. And uh, this was uh, one of them that we decided to take a look at. And I am certainly glad we did. So if you have uh, prospects that are draft eligible, you want us to take a look at and, and talk about on the show, you can send them to us via Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus national shows covering every league like Locked On NHL. Find Locked On Sports today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Have a great day, everyone.